Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this candidate forum um, presented by the League of Women Voters and the Mount Desert Islander. We are talking to candidates for um, Bar Harbor Select Board. Th these are the candidates for the two-year seat. Um, Brooke, who was here a moment ago, is still here, I hope. Shoot, we lost Brooke. Um, hope she comes back on. Um, so anyway, welcome. Um, I'm going to introduce our moderator for the night, and then um, the moderator will set the ground rules and introduce the candidates, and we'll be off and running. Um, we're planning for this to run until 630, but if we run out of questions before then, um, we'll quit while we're ahead. So our moderator tonight is Chris Crockett. He's a uh, publisher for um, for uh, Main State Media, specifically the Mount Desert Islander and the Ellsworth American. He's moderated forums before us a few times, so he's experienced at this, and we're really looking forward to having him um, conduct the session tonight. Take it away, Chris. Uh, thank you, Ann, and I, I like you calling me experienced at this. I, I appreciate that. So hello everyone and welcome to the first of two Bar Harbor Town Council candidate forums. My name is Chris Crockett. I'm the publisher of the Mount Desert Islander as well as several other weekly newspapers along the coast. Tonight, I am serving as your moderator. The candidates attending tonight's forum are vying for the open seat that was vacated by longtime Councilor Jeff Dobbs. It is a two year term. The candidates are Brooke Bloomquist, Earl Brecklin, Keith Goodrich and Charles Sidman. I'll be asking six questions covering a wide range of topics central to this election. The candidates were provided with the questions ahead of tonight's forum. The candidates will be given two minutes to introduce themselves, as well as two minutes at the end of the night for a closing statement. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer each of the questions. With that said, let's meet the candidates. First up is Brooke Bloomquist. Brooke has called Down East Maine her home for seven years. She is a sailor, a chef, and a year-round bartender working in Bar Harbor as part of the hospitality industry that underpins our local economy. Brooke witnessed firsthand the changes and challenges our community is facing. Um, regulars and friends know her as someone who takes an honest, no-nonsense approach to people and problem solving. And it's with that, it's with their encouragement that she has decided to take a more hands-on approach um, in serving her community and run for elected office. Brooke's goal is to serve as a strong and trusted voice for the people across the community as we navigate the challenges before us. Brooke looks forward to listening and learning from Bar Harbor residents, employees, business owners, students, and visitors about the community we want to shape together. Next is Earl Brecklin. Earl serves on the planning board in Bar Harbor. He uh, he has also served on the Warrant Committee and the Conservation Commission. A registered Maine guide, Earl is the author of eight books, including the award-winning Return to Moose River and the best-selling Wild, Weird, Wonderful Maine. Formerly an adjunct faculty member of the College of the Atlantic, Earl worked as a journalist on MDI for more than 37 years. He was inducted into the Maine Press Hall of Fame last year. Prior to retirement, he was communication director for Friends of Acadia. He and his wife, Roxy, live on the Eagles Lake Road. Our third candidate is Keith Goodrich. Keith has been a resident of Bar Harbor since 1986. Keith is a graduate of the College of the Atlantic and the American Institute of Banking degree programs. Keith is a former employee of Bar Harbor Banking and Trust and the Durgo Investments in Bar Harbor and Ellsworth. Keith has served as CFO for Alpha Marketing Inc., general manager for the Quimby House, in and operations manager of, of the Jonesport Wood Company and office director for First Express. Keith is a managing partner of the Corvus Group and is involved in many local groups, including the Red Cross, March of Dimes, Maine Arts, American Cancer Society, Davistown Museum, UMO and Collin Center, a Neighborhood House, and a former board member of the Mount Dirt Dessert Chamber of Commerce. And our last candidate is Charles Sidman. Charles' uh, recent civic activity has revolved around formulating and getting passed and defending the Bar Harbor Cruise Ship Initiative. Uh, for over 40 years before that, 
Charles raised his children and grandchildren during the pandemic in the local uh, school system. Worked at both of worked at both of our renowned laboratories, Jackson Lab and Mount Desert Island Biological Lab and College of the Atlantic. Charles supported his wife in her art gallery that continues to draw and endear visitors to our town. Organized uh, previous citizen initiatives, firing a cruise ship uh, pier at the ferry terminal and requiring local residents local residency to serve on town boards. Charles has been on the warrant committee, participated in the local cultural scene, flew scenic flights, served on various state boards, and as a global investor became um, conversant in finance, law, and ethics. Whew. Now, I think probably most everybody has heard enough from me. So let's move on and let each candidate give their uh, opening statement. We'll start uh, with you, Brooke. Hi, good evening, y'all. Um, thank you for the introduction, Chris. Um, most people know me as Zana, um, but uh, my the, the name on the ballot will be Brooke Blumquist. Um, as Chris said, that I am a sailor, I'm a chef. I'm originally from Texas and I've been living on the island, first in Hulse Cove and now right on Ledge Lawn in town since early 2019. And I was in the Machias area before moving to Mount Desert Island. And I feel incredibly fortunate to be part of this beautiful community on lovely MDI with a park in our backyard and the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean right in our dooryard. I'm excited for the opportunity to serve the people of Bar Harbor on town council. And I believe that I'm the right choice for this two year seat because I have an open mind and I have a willingness to listen to all sides. I will bring a decisive attitude to the council as we navigate these uncharted waters we're in. I've built my career on strong people skills and the ability to manage conflict. Two things that I've been told by community members that our town definitely needs right now. And during my time as council member, my top priorities will include creating safe, accessible, and affordable year-round housing, ensuring robust environmental protections, supporting year-round economic opportunities for all, and of course, building trust, transparency, and opportunities for meaningful public engagement across local government. I'm looking forward to hearing my fellow candidates' responses and building a flourishing year-round community together. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, up next is Earl Brecklin. Uh, I wanna thank uh, the League of Women Voters Down East and the Islander for uh, co-hosting this event. Hard to believe it's been five years uh, since I was part of that great organization. Um, I want to thank the other candidates for, for stepping up and volunteering to serve the community. And I want to thank everybody out there who's uh, tuning in and who takes the future of this community seriously for being part of this process. Um, I think through my service on the Warren Committee, the Conservation Commission, uh, currently on the planning board and over 37 years covering and reporting on Bar Harbor and the towns on Mount Desert Island that I've developed an appreciation appreciation of and respect for uh, what it takes to represent the people of this special place. Uh, through my nonprofit experience, uh, volunteering in Acadia National Park uh, and with other organizations, I think I've seen and helped solve some of the challenges uh, these partner organizations face as they work to make our lives and our communities better. Uh, some years back, I wrote a guest column about the need to strike a balance between Bar Harbor, the community, and Bar Harbor, the commodity. And one of the motivations for running for this office was I think right now, community is on the losing side of the equation. I think it's under assault by very powerful commercial forces. Um, different lawsuits, recent lawsuits, regardless of uh, what I consider specious claims that they're about property rights or they're about employment, uh, should really have a large asterisk next to them uh, because it's all about the money. And I'm going to repeat that. It's all about the money. And I want to be a champion for the people of this community uh, while also helping to strengthen commercial operations that are interested in investing in and strengthening 
the year-round community and helping keep both sides of that equation thriving and vital. Thank you. Thank you, Earl. Next up is Keith Goodrich. Good evening. Thank you again to the League of Women Voters and to the Islander, as Earl said, for co-hosting this opportunity. Um, I, on a personal note, am greatly appreciative of this opportunity, uh, given the fact that up until this was brought to my attention, I thought the meet the candidates was basically the blurb at the bottom of the page in the Islander for each candidate. So this is very exciting. And I really look forward to um, this entire process because I think the more information that we can provide to the voters, the better. Um, uh, as Chris mentioned, I've been on the island since 1986, uh, graduate of the College of the Atlantic. Um, I've worked for numerous businesses uh, in one capacity or another uh, across the island. Um, I consider Bar Harbor my home. I am from away. In 300 years, we can talk about being, you know, from from the island. But uh, until then, um, I continue to do my best to make the island my home and the best possible home for not only myself but for other members of the community. Um, I'm interested in running for this position because. Uh, I've done the other the other parts of participation. Uh, I voted. Uh, I bought I bought a house here. I moved here full time. Uh, I've been to the meetings. I've you know participated in all the debates and the discussions. And this is the next logical step, I think, for me and for the community that I, I call home. So thank you. Thank you, Keith. And rounding out our candidates tonight is Charles Sidman. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I want to thank you and the league for putting this on. And I want to pay my respects to the other candidates who are on the panel together. I think Bar Harbor is going to be well served. Um, so I've gotten into activism after a very varied career here. I, I started coming here as a visitor when I was about 10 years old. I've called this island my home for more than 40 years. I've voted and paid taxes here. Um, I have a, a very varied um, set of experiences and involvements on the community. I, I came here, as I say, as a, a visitor. I moved here to be a scientist at the Jackson Laboratory. I've also worked at the MDI Bio Lab and at the college. I've been a business person locally and distantly. I've participated in the the community, the tourist economy, et cetera. So I, I think I have a pretty broad um, familiarity with lots of the strains of activity here on the island. Um, I will say that I, just personality-wise, starting with science, I tend to focus on reality and action <laughs> rather than political talk. I find myself very in an odd place running for political office, but um, I've always had a a civic project underway as well as my employment uh, projects. And as most people know, I got involved with the cruise ship issue and economy about five years ago. Um, I have written extensively on it. I am a participant in the current lawsuit, which Earl referred to. And I found that running for political office was a necessary adjunct. So I'm presenting a vision that I believe resonates and is held by many of our neighbors and colleagues on this island. And I'm voicing that for a lot of people. Um, and honestly, if, if this resonates with the voters, I'll be elected. If not, so be it. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. And now we will begin with our first question on affordable housing. We used a random number generator to determine the order in which the candidates will answer questions tonight. We'll begin with you, Brooke, and then Earl, Keith, and Charles will answer in that order. So our first question, Brooke, do you believe that a lack of affordable workforce and year-round housing is an issue for the town? If not, why not? If so, what policies would you suggest to spur more affordable housing development? Where would additional housing go? 
Thank you. Um, I absolutely believe that the lack of affordable seasonal and year round housing is a major issue for the town. And it's one that I've personally experienced for as long as I've been on the island. Um, it took me four years of consistent searching to find year round housing in town. And I'm lucky enough to have found a room to rent in somebody's house, let alone a, a, my own apartment or even studio apartment. And for people that aren't in the market or already own homes or lived here for years, just to give you a little uh, insider's perspective of what the market is for leasing a room in somebody's house right now in town, it's anywhere from $800 to $1,200 a month just to rent a room. And I'd also like to read a comment from a recent housing survey done by the town. One of the uh, resident here said that housing costs are getting extreme and housing is not available. I just received notification that rent is going up 500 a month more. I may need to give up my job and move to where the cost of living is less, wrote one respondent in additional comments. More year round affordable rentals are desperately needed not just in Bar Harbor, but on MDI. And 87% of employers in Bar Harbor say that the supply of available housing is a barrier for attracting and retaining employees. So yeah, I think it's a huge issue. Policy-wise, I'd like to see the town develop more financial incentives for property owners to keep year-round rental properties and switch short-term rentals back to year-round housing voluntarily. I'd also like to examine how short-term rental licensing and permit fees are currently structured, especially for property owners who live outside of Bar Harbor, but with multiple short-term rentals. And I think that's all the time I have for this question, but I look forward to diving in a little bit deeper into this issue. Thank you, Brooke. Earl, same question. Do you believe that a lack of affordable workforce and year-round housing is an issue for the town? If not, why not? If so, what policies would you suggest to spur more affordable housing development and where would additional housing go? Thank you, Chris. Uh, yes, it is, it is a, an issue. As a matter of fact, it's a crisis. Um, uh, but before we even talk about the, the, the scope of that crisis, I think that uh, Bar Harbor has done better than many, many communities in Maine and how they've already begun to address this. Um, the Island Housing Trust has recently opened those units on Jones Marsh with more to come. Uh, the lab in Cons Atlantic have uh, constructed uh, dormitories for, for students and for people at the Jackson Lab uh, with them hotels, uh, has built uh, employee housing at the Oceanside and now going in on the corner of Kibo Street and, and Mount Desert Street. Uh, and they've pledged to turn some of the various properties they've owned for employee housing in town back into residential property, which is uh, very welcome. Uh, the Bayview has added a couple of units of employee housing in the park has uh, worked with Congress to allow the, the land that they have in Town Hill to be used for uh, employee housing there and working with Friends of Acadia. I think that's a great thing. And more than anything else, I think we passed the cap on vacation rentals. Uh, there are 600 vacation rentals licensed in the town of Bar Harbor. 100 of those are year-round residents. The rest are investor-owned. And I think uh, when you look at a report that shows we have, we're 600 housing units down in Bar Harbor and five, more than 500 of those uh, are vacation rental units, that, that can tell you a lot right there. Uh, on the planning board, we've been working on a package of changes to help reduce the cost of development and building housing in Bar Harbor. Those will be on the, the ballot right off. Uh, we're also waiting till after the comprehensive plan process, which is near its end, uh, is done before we do more. We're also working uh, to implement the rules of uh, state LD 2003, which uh, required as of July, double the density on most residential lots in Maine, but they haven't pr promulgated the rules yet. So I think that uh, trying to work with market forces instead of against them, I don't think publicly we can build our way out. And uh, I think there's a lot more to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Earl. Uh, Keith, for you, same question. Do you believe that the lack of affordable workforce and year round housing is an issue for the town? If not, why not? If so, what policies would you suggest to spur more affordable housing development? Where would additional housing go? I 
definitely agree with both of the candidates so far, and I'm guessing Charlie as well, that there is a, as Earl said, critical need for something to be done. Uh, I think that there are a number of ways to approach this uh, particular uh, crisis. Uh, number one would be uh, working with uh, the town and their ordinances, uh, something that's commonly known as LUZO, uh, which is in some respect uh, attributed to making it more affordable to build a hotel or a bed and breakfast than it is to build a residential unit, whether it be single family, multifamily home. Um, I think that there are uh, a lot of contributing factors. I know when I was first uh, on the island at school, I actually did a, a statistical analysis of a survey that was done by the housing authority of all the uh, employees at the lab and the hospital um, and crunch the numbers then. So even back to the late 80s, affordable housing has been an issue that has faced not only the town, but as Brooke said, the island at large. And I think that there are fewer and fewer places, as you said, to build new places. Where would it go? Um, I'm sure there are pro probably lots of thoughts as to where things would go, whether that be um, existing commercial lots, um, renovating uh, a, a commercial property or an existing residential property uh, to make it higher density. As Earl mentioned, Jones Marsh is a step in the right direction, a very positive step in the right direction. Um, but I think that there's a lot to be unpacked on that issue. And it's one of the things that I hope to focus on should I be chosen to serve on the council. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. And finally, Charles, do you believe that a lack of affordable workforce and year round housing is an issue for the town? If not, why not? If so, what policies would you suggest to spur more affordable housing development? Where would that additional housing go? Okay, I'm happy to chime in here. Um, it's clearly an issue because we've heard from all four candidates um, that it's an issue and we've heard you know, lots of um, community sentiment that it's an issue. I have a bit of reservation, however, as to how realistic it is to meet all of those needs. Um, it's an issue, it's people's desire, but how do we balance or judge the need and the reason I say this is we are on one of the most attractive pieces of, of land on the planet. We have very expensive real estate here. Everybody wants to be here. I get it. We're all here for that, partly that reason. But people also make choices. I know lots of professionals with you know, very reasonable salaries, business owners, et cetera. Um, it's not only the workforce. It's not only a workforce issue. We can pay more, anybody can pay more to live locally or pay less to have, uh, to live a little bit further away. You know, the Jackson Lab draws its workforce from about an hour radius around Bar Harbor. So these are individual choices and some people want to live very close. Some people would rather live further away for the, um, the trade-offs that are involved. So, whether it's a need or a desire, I'm not so sure. What can the town do? I think there's a lot of things that can be done. We've already referred to zoning, um, land use changes. Um, the various nonprofits are contributing um, a more affordable housing. I think that's great. The town and the community can assist in that because the town has facilities for borrowing at much lower interest rates. So they could assist people and institutions that want to develop more affordable housing. So I think there's a lot that we can do and I'm sure we will do some of that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Charles. And we'll move on to our next question that's regarding cruise ships. And we'll begin with you, Keith, and then Charles, Earl, and Brooke. All right, the question, the appropriate level of cruise ship visitation is a disputed issue. 
Suggested solutions range from reducing or eliminating cruise ship landings to uh, continuing current practice. What is the right level of cruise ship tourism for Bar Harbor? Uh, it's a very interesting question and certainly a very loaded topic. Uh, I think that uh, we have basically embraced both extremes um, up, up, in, up until the most recent uh, initiative was passed. Uh, we had some, some con concern about things uh, where it wasn't everybody who wanted to come. So we had to scale back the number of ships that visited from just a sheer volume of you know, overwhelming the waterfront, overwhelming the town. Um, but I think that we need to be um, a little bit more uh, aware of the, the need for balance. Um, this is, as Charlie said, uh, a very uh, desirable location and a destination. We are in the top 10 most visited national parks in, in the continental United States. So we have millions of visitors every year and whether they come across the bridge at the head of the island or across the gangplank at the, at the dock, um, they're here to see Bar Harbor and Bar Harbor and the island at large benefit from those visitors. It's how a lot of us make our living. Um, so I think that the, uh, the council appointed the cruise ship committee to come up with a plan for going forward because they recognize the need for balance. And I think that that balance is still somewhere out in the distance. Um, I believe that we will be able to reach that. Um, and Compromise is a large part of that. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, next up, Charles, same question. The appropriate level of cruise ship visitation is a disputed issue. Suggested solutions range from reducing or eliminating cruise ship landings to continuing the current practice. What is the right level of cruise ship tourism for Bar Harbor? Right, well, as everybody knows, I've been deeply involved in this issue and I was the formulator of the um, initiative which passed last fall. Um, we talked to a lot of people and the opinions we obtained range from zero cruise ships, primarily for environmental concerns, to as many as we can get, primarily for you know, financial concerns and goals. We settled on a number which was a substantial reduction but was not an elimination. And so I don't think anybody is, is essentially anti-cruise ship. The question is the appropriate balance. Cruise ship visitors represent approximately one-tenth of the visitors that come to the town and the island each year. Um, but on many days, they overwhelm the town and there are, it's not all positive profit and benefit um, a lot of businesses and other visitors are compromised when the crowds get too intense. So I think the real issue is not the number per se, but spreading it out so that it's more tolerable and the best benefit for the most people. I mean, even Acadia National Park is limiting access. And you know, we talk, we're beginning to talk about the carrying capacity of our town and region. It applies to more than just cruise ships we cannot take more and more people forever. Um, you know, infinite growth is synonymous with cancer. And so I don't think that's a practical um, solution. So we've proposed and the citizens accepted a number. The citizens can change it in the future, um, but I'm very supportive of the current initiative level that was passed, which is rep roughly a two thirds reduction uh, per day over what pertained in the recent past. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, on to you, Earl, same question. The appropriate level of cruise ship visitation is disputed. Suggested solutions range from reducing or eliminating cruise ship landings to continuing the current practice. 
what is the right level of cruise ship tourism for Bar Harbor? Uh, well, first, I wanted to uh, thank Charlie, as, as I did in the planning board meeting when it came before us, uh, for his leadership on this issue. And uh, I, I have a diff somewhat different opinion in that I, I certainly know the correct level of visitation is not 220 or 250 ships a year, but it's also not zero. And so I think trying to find that balance is what's most important. And the, one of the differences we have is I did not believe that it belonged, that this particular ordinance belonged in the land use zoning ordinance. I think that it sh should have been a regular ordinance. And I also had some concerns about the thousand people a day cap, because what happens is that doesn't apply when 95% of the ships that might be visiting have more passengers and crew than that. And so I think it becomes a de facto ban in many court cases, whether it's intentional or accidental. Um, when you ban something through a law that tries to appear to be something else, you, you're probably gonna lose in court. Uh, I think there's a way to craft a strategy, limiting it to one ship a day, so many days a year, uh, so that that takes away uh, that uh, the thousand people cap, but also you can limit the number of days to the point that it comes close to the same number of passengers per year, but works logically for the industry at the same time. It gives us some days a week with no ships. I think the council, uh, which certainly uh, had they acted more quickly, Charlie wouldn't have had to begin his initiative if, he, if they had listened to the people that we wanted something done about cruise ships that could have been done. So I think the council should go on the offensive. It needs to draft some laws to regulate the shoreside activities of the other businesses should the lawsuit uh, uh, prevail and Bar Harbor find itself on the losing side of that. So we have some other regulations to put in place and it doesn't get all thrown out right away. And also there's a public relations battle. We've seen that this week uh, that the council needs to engage to show what the, the people's sentiments are. Thank you. Thank you, Earl. Um, now, Brooke, same question. The appropriate level of cruise ship visitation is a disputed issue. Suggested solutions range from reducing or eliminating cruise ship landings to continuing the current practice. What is the right level of cruise ship tourism for Bar Harbor? I believe the right level of cruise ship tourism in Bar Harbor is one that the community decides what that is. Um, I think Earl has a lot of great ideas and I fall in line with a lot of his uh, sentiments that he just shared. The unfortunate reality um, that I'm seeing is that we as a community, residents, business owners, town staff, elected officials, we have yet to actually sit down and have a genuine and open conversation about how to work through this issue. And we have, now we have a situation where the cruise ship talk is taking up all the air in the room and further polarizing and creating mistrust and keeping us from tackling multiple other issues that we're dealing with. And it's not something that some magic bullet policy is gonna fix nor one individual will have the right solution for. But on a personal level, I believe that tourism is a vital part of our community and we need to find a way to be welcoming to visitors regardless of how they arrive to our island. That said, I know that congestion from visitors uh, from all types are becoming a major issue during the summer and limiting cruise ship disembarkments during the peak season would be a major benefit to keeping downtown a pleasant place for locals and visitors without business owners having to take a cut in revenue. I think that we need more data about when peak season actually is and how much cruise ship traffic benefits the entire community, as well as what it costs in terms of infrastructure and staff time. And I'd like to invite all the members of the community to participate in a meaningful discussion about the roles of cruise ships in Bar Harbor, and, and not just over Facebook, uh, in order to make this determination so that we can have a sustainable long-term relationship. Thank you, Brooke. Our next question is about tourism. We'll begin with you, Charles, and then Brooke, Keith, and Earl. What would be your vision for visitation and tourism in town? 
how would you propose to strike a balance between controlling vehicle and pedestrian traffic and keeping the town open for visitors? Well, I um, recognize that tourism is one of our main um, priorities and economic engines. So we're, no one is against that. Uh, the question is, as on the last one, the question of balance and that one strain does not put an unreasonable burden on other activities. I think all of this really boils down to the carrying capacity issue that whether it's cruise ships or visits to the park or how many vehicles one can have or how many rental units are in existence, things cannot keep increasing ad infinitum. Um, I haven't been to the top of Cadillac since, or maybe once since the um, permit system went in. Um, I used to go up there a lot eat a lot of sub sandwiches for dinner and watch the sunset. <laughs> Haven't done that in a long time. Um, we are simply reaching a carrying capacity and that I'm, I'm pleased that the town is looking at that as part of the comprehensive plan, um, but we can't wait till 2035 to get our act together and make some decisions. I think we have to do some things now um, and you know, the voters have decided on this issue, they will decide on other issues, um, but we have to try to make it welcoming to as many people as we can without degrading the experience for all. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Charles. Um, Brooke, you're up. What would, your, what would be your vision for visitation and tourism in the town? How would you propose to strike a balance between controlling vehicle and pedestrian traffic and keeping the town open for visitors? Well, I think I started to outline that vision a little bit in my previous answer, um, but we need to be making decisions about visitation and tourism as a whole community based on quality data and who benefits and who bears the costs of receiving millions of visitors every year. I'm hopeful that the ongoing comprehensive plan process will help give us a roadmap for that balance. But if we wanna be thriving year round community, we need to think about big projects like improving walkability in the downtown and expanding public transit options. And I think it would really benefit Bar Harbor to look at other coastal communities like Freeport and and Belfast and even other coastal communities outside of Maine and learn from what they've been able to implement to help us develop that vision and make it a reality. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, Keith, you're up. What would be your vision, vision for visitation and tourism in town? How would you propose to strike a balance between controlling vehicle and pedestrian traffic and keeping the town open for visitors. One of the driving forces, not only in Bar Harbor, but on the island and in Maine in general is tourism, visitors, guests. Um, we have uh, been a destination for over a century uh, from way back when uh, my grandmother, uh, remembers bringing, uh, coming up on the steamer from Boston and landing at the pier and taking a wagon out to the Jordan Pond House for tea and popovers. Um, so certainly my familial connections to the island and the tourism industry uh, go way back, as they say. Um, we have the uh, Gateway Center in Trenton that is been in development for years at this point. The Island Explorer is, is a resource, but it has limited runs. Um, and I think that the park has decades of data, whether it be visitation or environmental impact. Um, I think that the town has um, grown to the confines of its physical boundaries. And all of those are factors that need to be taken into consideration when coming up with a plan that is going to involve some very difficult 
and painful choices. Yes, I, again, we, we, we come, come back to this time and time again, balance, we're looking for a balance. Um, a number of businesses that I have worked for or worked with um, are based on tourism and we have a season. It starts sometime after tax day in April and runs through uh, Veterans Day in November if we're lucky. So we have a defined parameter and we need to work from there. Thank you, Keith. Uh, Earl, your turn. What would be your vision for visitation and tourism in town? How would you propose to strike a balance between controlling vehicle and pedestrian traffic and keeping the town open for visitors? Thank you, Chris. I think uh, the first and, and, and foremost, the issue is really vehicles. And I think the town can control that by uh, parking availability. And I think the town should think long and hard before it ever entertains another proposal to create any more public parking because uh, there's just too many cars. And if you really think about it, uh, when you look at parking, there's it, it really, we're almost trying to create three spaces for every vehicle, one in the park, one at their hotel, and one in town. And I think the Island Explorer was such a success because it, it helped us leave those cars at where places that people were staying and and to do that and uh they they've broken ground on the new visitor center and parking lot in uh the transportation center in trenton partnership of the park and the state and friends of acadia uh, and i know the island explorer they're they're planning additional bus runs uh, as the, the park implements its transportation plan and it's interesting because the park doesn't limit visitation the congressional mandate does not let them say stop only so many people can, can come in, but they can limit vehicles and that's exactly what they're going to do they're going to end up with a finite set of parking spaces and smaller buses and to improve improve the experience there. So it's really hard the community needs to work with its partners, the state and with the park, because uh, as long as the park accepts all comers the town is going to be inundated as people pass on their way through and. Uh, I think that the comprehensive plan will help inform that and uh, together we can find a way to just make sure we're not buried in vehicles and buried in people. Thank you, Earl. We'll move on to our next question that's uh, regarding uh, education. We'll start with you, Earl, and then Charles, Brooke, and Keith. On the June 13th town ballot, Bar Harbor voters will be asked to approve funding for the construction of a new school. Do you support the school bond? Why or why not? If not, what is the alternative? Uh, thank you. I, I do support the school bond, but I totally understand the worry that folks have about paying for it. And uh, that's why I worked this past winter with Representative Lynn Williams and with Jill Goldthwaite to introduce and get past uh, LD-166 uh, which the governor signed into the law last month, which allows revenues from parking meters to be used not just for streetscapes and parking garages and things of that nature, but for any capital expense that a community may have. And with Bar Harbor on target for next year in the neighborhood of $3 million in parking revenue, there's enough money to run the parking program to do plenty of streetscape and sidewalk improvements and, and provide funds that could be used if the council directs it to be done, and I would certainly want to do this, uh, to at least cut in half what the bond repayment would be for that school. And I think that there's also uh, possible avenues for federal grants that I know the school board and the school committee have been diligent in trying to explore. Katie National Park is 33% of our property area in the town of Bar Harbor and pays around $75,000 in lieu of taxes each year. And I think that considering that federal facility and its land's impact on the community, it's not unreasonable to ask Congress to help uh, the people of this community that are impacted by that to, to help fund its new school. Thank you, Earl. Uh, on to you, Charles, same question. On the June 13th town ballot, Bar Harbor voters will be asked to approve funding for the construction of a new school. Do you support the school bond? Why or why not? If not, what is the alternative? Okay, well, let me start. Thank you, Chris. Um, let me start by saying there's nobody more fervently supportive of education and top quality education for our young people. 
I put children and grandchildren through our local schools and was very pleased with the results and grateful for everyone involved. I'm concerned, however, that we're a little premature at this time to commit to this bond for this particular design. And I'm hoping if I should be elected that before the end of this two year term, we can get to the point where it is time to make that decision that we have enough information. The issues that concern me are, first of all, I don't think we have a very good grasp on how many students we have to be preparing for in the future. Secondly, we've got a huge issue being discussed now of consolidation. That was critical for our high schools. We reduced four high schools to one on this island. And if we should consolidate, the desks and the space is there today without a major new building project. So I think we have to decide if we're going to do that as an island or not. And then third, we have the additional funding opportunities and possibilities, which I think should be supported or pursued. So I am not comfortable committing the town to a massive project given the other expenses that are currently due. We've had double digit tax increases last year, this year, and I predict for the next several. So until we really know what's appropriate and necessary, I think we should go along. I usually drive old cars. I try to keep them going <laughs> for as long as possible. The school needs some work. Obviously, we can't have you know rain coming in on the kids' heads, but I think it's still a little bit early before committing to this major new project. Thank you, Charles. Uh, you're up next, Brooke. On the June 13th town ballot, Far Harbor voters will be asked to approve funding for the construction of a new school. Do you support the school bond? Why or why not? If not, what is the alternative? Thank you, Chris. Um, I will support whatever the voters decide regarding Connor Simison. We know the school is definitely in condemnable condition and our kids deserve better. Um, but even if the bond does pass, we need to acknowledge that we let the situation happen in the first place. <laughs> I mean, thanks to decades of underinvestment in our public infrastructure, the Emerson is in the state that it is now. But we also need to be talking about what we're going to do in the interim to make our kids are able to learn in a safe space and that the teachers are able to work safely and comfortably while a new building is going to be built since that's still what five years until a new school would be completed. So it seems like to me that conversations about consolidation are happening, but they're happening separately from the school bond proposal and on somewhat of separate timelines. And if consolidation does happen, even in for the interim, I mean, I don't think that the voters of Bar Harbor should be asked to pay for an entirely new school. And uh, thanks for um, Earl for making a, a testimony and working with Lynn on that to redistribute the funds that the revenue that we get from parking. I think that's a great idea. Um, and there's maybe other options available out there to look into so that the full cost isn't just on uh, on um, the Bar Harbor voters and taxpayers. Thank you, Brooke. Um, Keith, you're up on the June 13th town ballot. Bar Harbor voters will be asked to approve funding for the construction of a new school. Do you support the school bond? Why? Um, why or why not? If not, what is the alternative? Um, it's uh, we we need we need a new building, or at least we need a massive uh, overhaul of the building. It's uh, somewhat uh, interesting because if I if I look off off to my right. Uh, I look at the edge of the playground of the school. Um, they are right across the street from me. So basically, uh, it's in my backyard. Um, and uh, I know that there are a lot of challenges facing this project. 
Uh, I know that uh, over 49% of our property taxes in Bar Harbor go towards the educational system. Um, and I think that uh, as Brooke mentioned, to have let the school get this far means that that was one heck of a box of band-aids that we have been slowly putting on over and over again, sometimes on top of each other. Um, a large number of members of my family are educators of one kind or another, uh, from my great grandparents down to uh, younger siblings. Um, there are many challenges facing uh, the educational systems, uh, not only here in Bar Harbor, but across the country. And I think that for this issue to be as dragged out as it is and as convoluted as it is, is not right. Um, consolidation is a viable option, but are we farming all the kids from Bar Harbor to Northeast and Bernard and all the other schools on the island? Are we doing something reciprocal with Ellsworth? There are just a lot of unanswered questions. Um, and the price tag keeps changing from moment to moment. And I think, I guess to, to summarize, we need to pick a lane and we need to stick to it. Thank you, Keith. And now we'll move on to our next question about taxes. We'll start with you, Brooke, and then it will be Charles, Earl, and Keith. The question is, do you favor a local option tax on meals and or lodging for Bar Harbor? Why or why not? I believe that investigating a local option sales tax or a lodging tax is an important priority for the council to explore in terms of developing alternative revenue streams outside of property taxes. Um, if developed well, I think a local option tax could help more equally distribute some of the costs of high visitation, uh, its impact on infrastructure and the community and to onto the folks who spend time here. So, but it's also my understanding that a local option tax is not really currently feasible for Bar Harbor at this time because of an existing state law but a number of, um, oh, the existing state law, that's a number of bills to allow municipalities to develop a local option are being considered by the state legislator. And I'd like to see the council as a whole engage more directly with what's going on on a state level. And that's definitely one of the a main issue that's worth um, engaging on at a higher level outside of just our municipality and developing and promoting deeper relationships at a state level will also help us with a lot of other options and maybe help us come up with um, yeah other means of, of revenue to help alleviate some burdens from the taxpayers. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, Charles, you're up next. Do you favor a local option tax on meals and or lodging for Bar Harbor? Why or why not? Right, thank you. Um, I favor it because as Brooke says, we need additional revenue streams. The problem is it's a really heavy lift because it's not in our power to do. It has to be approved and grant, the authority has to be granted in Augusta. So this one is is not something we can just do. We have to ask others for permission to do it. But I'm hopeful that it can be done because honestly, every, every deal or permission is a negotiation. It has to um, provide something of value for both sides. And I don't understand or see what the state or other communities would lose by Bar Harbor and other communities being able to have local taxes. Um, if we priced ourselves too high, which I think would be difficult to do since we're so attractive, but if we did, we could drive more traffic to other towns, which would only be welcomed by then. 
And if we are more successful, even without driving traffic to other towns, we will have a more successful economy. We will send more tax dollars to Augusta. So I'm actually pretty positive that it can be done. It will be a, a serious negotiation project, but as all good negotiations go, I think there's something in it for everybody. It's not gonna be easy, but I think it's possible. So I would favor working on it. Thank you, Charles. Earl, you're up next. Do you favor a local option tax on meals and or lodging for Bar Harbor? Why or why not? Uh, I think it's it's a, a wonderful approach to ask the, the people that are having the largest impact on this community, the, the millions of visitors that pass through each year, uh, help pay for the infrastructure and the services um, that they avail themselves of. And um, I think it could be approached in Augusta as allowing individual communities to decide uh, if they wanted to have it or whether they wouldn't. I know in the past, uh, the state has tried this many times and it has failed to get through the legislature. In one iteration, uh, all the money went to the state. The state took 40% and then sent some back to the towns. Uh, another iteration, uh, the state sent some back to towns, including towns that didn't collect any of that revenue. So uh, I think one of the things that uh, would be great is if the state uh, could see its way to say, look, these towns are service centers, they have the largest impact and should uh, to get those uh, uh, particular uh, revenue. And uh, the business is certainly worried it would be a deterrent. But I would ask anyone listening or, or anyone I would talk to and say, well, when you went to Boston or you went to New York or, or you went to Portland for that fact, um, did you make your decision on where to stay or where to eat, whether whether the uh, room tax was eight dollars or whether it was free or what have you? And I think that um, that that isn't an argument that we should give a lot of weight to that. Uh, we look at the demand that Bar Harbor has. I think the traffic can bear it. And uh, we, we can certainly use that revenue uh, to help uh, ease the burden on taxpayers in this community. Thank you, Earl. Uh, Keith, you're up. Do you favor a local option tax on meals and or lodging for Bar Harbor? Why or why not? Uh, as both uh, Brooke and uh, Charlie have touched on, um, unfortunately, that at this time is not our decision to make. Uh, we, have, we have state sales tax. We have a state lodging tax. And I think Earl touched upon something that might be a more palatable solution, which is to approach the state about getting a larger percentage of the revenue that we are already collecting on behalf of the state back. Um, uh, in past work lives, so to speak, I have dealt with um, states uh, and conducted business in states where they have a state tax, a county tax, and a town tax or a city tax. Um, which is just one layer upon another layer. And as um, Earl mentioned, you know, the lodge, you know, accommodation fees and things like that, that show up on your bill when you check out of a hotel. Um, not a lot of people are going to be making their decisions based on, um, you know, so what's that going to cost me and itemize the bill for me before I even check in. So, um, I think uh, it might as well be uh, considered uh, alongside putting a toll booth at the head of the island. Thank you, Keith. And that brings us to the last question of the night before we move on to our closing statements. We'll begin with you, Earl, and then Keith, Charles, and Brooke. The question of conflicts of interest has arisen <clears throat> at Bar Harbor. Do you think this is a problem in our town? How should town council help address it? Thank you, Chris. Um, I think that the town has uh, an ethics ordinance and I think it needs to be followed closely. But I also think it's paramount for each member of the town council to insist that it be applied and that other members of the council follow it closely as well. Uh, Supreme Court Justice Brandeis once said, sunshine is the best disinfectant. And I think that, uh, being very careful and putting everything that can be done on disclosure forms, 
I think uh, if a counselor has the slightest inkling that there's a conflict or an appearance of a conflict, they should bring it up. We've been very good about that on the planning board and the board votes whether someone has a conflict. It's all part of the public meeting. It's on television, it's in the minutes. And I think that that uh, needs to be followed. And, and I think if fellow counselors believe someone isn't following the ethics ordinance uh, um, as closely as it should be, they should, to, should call it out. Um, I think one of the things uh, that I have a problem with from a conflict of interest uh, uh, standpoint in the town uh, is the cruise ship committee. And I know the council has suspended the cruise ship committee, but I think it's high time for it to go away. And I think three decades ago when um, this was all new and it made sense to have a group that included the pilots and the land-based tour operators and the cruise ship companies and the state and customs to work through how to do this but we've been doing it for decades now and uh, i think it isn't so much that there's any giant conflict of interest there in that people just look at that group and say i think they're working against my interest not necessarily those of the town and it's time to change that structure so i think that's important uh again Public perception is important. And I think there's often in a small town, everybody knows everybody, been parts of different groups. I don't think we should cast aspersions on people because of uh, their memberships and their previous involvement in the community because uh, that's how we live here. That's what makes this community special. But I, I do think we need, to, especially to watch for financial conflicts. Thank you, Earl. Uh, Keith, you're up next. The question of conflicts of interest has arisen in Bar Harbor. Do you think this is a problem in our town? How should town council help address it? Um, the question is a, a little broad. I think the uh, reasoning or the impetus behind the, the question was uh, the uh, perceived conflicts of interest on the town council itself. Um, and so I think that needs to be made clear that that's what the question is really about is the perceived conflict of interest on uh, specific town council members and their participation in projects or voting on projects that they had an interest in um, the uh, ethics um, rules that uh, the town has adopted I think um, need to be revisited. Um, and there needs to be a little bit more of a, as Earl said, scrutiny of things. And so, you know, someone someone plays devil's advocate and says, worst case scenario, you know, this this is not right. Um, and I think that council being, as Earl said, drawn from members of the community, which is very small, um, that people don't want to hurt other people's feelings. They don't want to be the person saying no. Um, and uh, so I think that's really where I fall on the question of ethics and uh, the question at hand. Thank you, Keith. Uh, up next is Charles. The question of conflicts of interest has arisen in Bar Harbor. Do you think this is a problem in our town? How should the town council help address it? Okay, thank you again. Um, I'm going to make a very strong statement here. I believe that the ethics issue is an existential crisis for democracy in our town. It's a problem with individuals and it's a problem with our institutions and it is most definitely not limited to the town council or only applying to the town council. Um, the cruise ship committee was an example that um, Earl brought up. That was an instance with allocated seats that the fox, the foxes, a pack of foxes have been given charge of the hen house. That's just wrong. <laughs> and so the present ethics ordinance, it starts from a a fine place, but we haven't educated about it so that most of our town officials don't understand it. Um, there is very little, far less than uh, desirable transparency in the process. And it's all based on voluntary recusal. We need enforcement. So the town council being our legislative body has to take the lead 
in enacting a new ordinance, but it needs to apply to everybody doing business for the town, full stop. So thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. Uh, Brooke, you're up. The question of conflicts of interest has arisen in Bar Harbor. Do you think this is a problem in our town? How should town council help address it? Oh, Brooke, you're muted. <laughs> yeah, well, Bar Harbor is a small town and everyone knows each other and we're pretty much know everybody's business or at least, you know, we think we do. And we know the folks in the community who are involved in politics and who works in town. And it's my view that we should be as transparent as possible about all potential conflicts of interest and take time to talk about and address them openly without shaming people. And the town just did a survey on the current ethics ordinance. And I think it's clear that there's a real concern of a lack of trust among the community about how decisions are getting made. And I think it's important to recognize that the lack of trust is based on some very real barriers for people in the community to participate in meetings and feel like their voices are heard and valued. And revising the ethics ordinance to become more clear and then making sure that we're enforcing it, like mother the gentleman have mentioned is a key step for the count, town council to take this is a way that we can address existing conflicts of interest as well as the overall perception that there is a conflict of interest in how the town makes major decisions and relatedly i'd also like to really look at how our existing committees are structured and what changes could be made to make sure that those committees are useful and effective. And if serving on those communities is accessible to those that really care about the issues that they're looking at. Thank you, Brooke. Those are all of our questions for tonight. So we're going to move on to our closing statements. And we will stay with you, Brooke. Um, we'll start with you. All right. Well, I want to thank you, Chris, and the League of Women Voters, MD Islander, for putting the, hosting this event. And thank you to uh, the other candidates for your participation. Um, I look forward to working with all community members from all backgrounds. Um, whether they just moved here or if they've been here their whole lives, um, to find more balance, to, to promote year-round economic opportunities. For, I want to collaborate to ensure more and ro robust environmental protections. I want to focus on addressing land use and transport with a transparent government. And I want to, I'm not doing this alone. I wouldn't be doing this if I was doing it alone or doing it for myself. And so I want to also thank all of the participants of the townspeople that are watching and um, that want to stay informed. I want to encourage people to stop me in town and pick my brain, tell me what your thoughts and concerns are. And uh, so we can keep these uh, positive conversations flowing. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, up next uh, for his closing statements is Earl. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Chris. Uh, again, I want to thank both the League of Women Voters Down East and the Islander for organizing and running this and, and want to thank everyone who's uh, taken the opportunity to tune in, maybe watching this later on video, um, to try to learn more about some potential direction the town can take and, and thank my fellow candidates. I think there's been some great ideas and some, some uh, 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 great things tossed out here tonight and, and I'm impressed with the dedication to this community that, that I've seen here. Uh, and finally, I wanna really uh, urge people to turn out for town meeting, open town meeting on June 6th and the elections on June 13th. Um, I'm not gonna tell anyone uh, who they should or, or shouldn't vote for. 
I mean, I think people are smart enough to, to make up your own minds. Uh, I just want you to vote. I just think that's the most important thing. Our vote is our power. I talked earlier about following the money and the money that we're up against. The vote is what can counter that and give us the vision for the community that we want. Uh, I wanna say that I believe that my experience, my dedication to fairness and balance and commitment to this community uh, is what's needed for the challenges ahead. Um, it boils down to one simple difference. Do you think Bar Harbor should be first and foremost a place people go to, or do you think it should be a fantastic place to live and be from? And I think that's the question that we had before us in this election and in the years ahead. I think we can balance both. And I pledge, if elected, uh, I will do my best to do just that. Thank you, Earl. Uh, Keith, you're up for your closing statement. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ann Luther from the League of Women Voters. I'd like to thank Chris for being our moderator this evening. Uh, my esteemed co-candidates here, uh, it's been truly a pleasure getting to know you um, that much better. Some of you I've known for decades and some of you I've just met uh, actually face to face today. So um, as Earl said, the worst you could do is participate, uh, vote, show up, come to the meetings. You know, that's why I'm here. You know, I, I voted, I showed up to the meetings, I participated in the discussions, and this is the next logical progression to making a difference to the place where I live and I work and you all work and live, hopefully. Um, if you don't show up, if you don't vote, if you don't participate, they there are mail-in ballots for a reason, folks. If you can't get to the polls or you're too busy, uh, you, you have to work. Get the absentee ballot, vote, participate, make your voice heard because we can't make the changes that we will need to survive the next 20, 30 years. I mean, we've got Bar Harbor 2035 coming up. The comprehensive planning meetings start in two weeks. Go to those. And like I said, turn out for the meeting on in June, early June and vote. Thank you so much. Thank you, Keith. Um, now, uh, up, you're up, uh, Charles. All right, well, I'll echo my colleagues here by thanking you, Chris, and the League and the Islander for putting on this excellent session. Um, in my closing statement, I will say that I have taken an activist position in the recent past, everybody knows that, with some very concrete action steps that I believe give voice to widespread sentiment in the community. Um, if the community continues to support these um, directions, I will be grateful for the opportunity to participate and serve. I believe, and I was educated to believe in servant leadership. It's not leadership about me, it's about serving the constituents and the citizens. And I hope that while a typical June election gets a thousand voters and last fall's election got almost 3000, I hope we can make this the exception and have 3000 people vote in this coming June election. So thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. Uh, and that's the show for tonight. Um, Ann, did you have something you wanted to add? Well, I'll just thank you all once again, the candidates for participating, for your willingness to run and serve and for your contribution to making this an informative session tonight. Thank you to Chris and the Islander for co-sponsoring this event with us. We had over 50 people tune in live and we'll be posting an audio link or a video link um, that people can watch between now and election day. So we hope we'll get maybe 10 times as many people watching before then. We'll be doing the second forum tomorrow night beginning at six o'clock when we'll have the seven candidates for the three three year seats. Um, so if you're available, tune in for that as well. Once again, thank you for this evening. Um, good night. We'll see you tomorrow.